Alice in Chains is widely regarded as one of the best and most respected bands of all time. The band is considered one of the big four of grunge, the other three being Nirvana, Soundgarden, and Pearl Jam. Though Alice in Chains was consistently compared to the three groups I previously mentioned, they were always more metal-leaning with huge, sludgy riffs. But this was a band with a soft side as well, that had, like Nirvana, a big appreciation for acoustic music. The 1992 EP Sap was almost entirely acoustic, showing a different side of Alice compared to the heaviness of their debut. Alice released yet another acoustic EP, Jar of Flies, in early 1994. This one has become known as one of the most highly regarded EPs of all time, featuring a few of the band's most noteworthy tracks. One of those songs is Nutshell, the second track on the EP. A very sobering moment of 90s alternative, being covered many times since its original 1994 release. It's one of those rare songs that as soon as you hear the opening acoustic riff, you immediately enter a state of reflection. In this video, I'll cover the story behind Jar of Flies, talk about the songs, and get into why Nutshell is the most haunting track Alice in Chains ever wrote. Let's go. Going into Jar of Flies, the band had been on a lengthy tour following 1992's Dirt. This was a rather tumultuous period for Alice in Chains, with Lane Staley's drug use intensifying, but he wasn't the only member that had an issue with drugs. Bassist Mike Starr did as well, to the point he was kicked out of the band in early 1993, in the middle of the Dirt tour. This tour, which would ultimately become the band's final with Lane Staley, burnt them out significantly, putting their tenure to the ultimate test. So when the tour was finally wrapping up in late 93, the band desperately needed to decompress. In September 1993, coming off a much needed vacation, the band regrouped with the intention of recording some new music in the form of an EP. But a different approach was taken, with the band opting to write the tracks together instead of apart. In terms of the sound Alice was trying to capture, they definitely were against something heavy and loud. The band had reached a point in which they needed to write softer, more introspective tracks to recollect themselves. There's also the rather famous story of the band returning home from tour, only to discover they had been evicted. And this perhaps is another reason the band wanted to record the EP when they did, as they could move into the recording studio for the time being, and have a little while to figure things out. Ultimately, the band booked a 10-day recording session on September 7th, 1993, at Seattle's London Bridge but the tracks would come together in just seven of those days. Going into the recording process of Jar of Flies, the band had nothing written whatsoever aside from part of No Excuses. The band simply jammed and hammered out seven tracks in seven days. This was also the first release following Mike Starr's departure, and the first with new bassist Mike Inez. Though if you want to get technical, Inez did appear on the two tracks, What the Hell Have I and A Little Bitter, for the last Action Hero soundtrack earlier in 1993. So without any clear ideas in mind aside from wanting a softer sound, the band got to work very quickly with limited time. But before I get into the tracks, let's go over the cover art and the title of the EP very quickly. The title, Jar of Flies, came from Jerry Cantrell's third grade science experiment, Here's a quote from Lane Staley describing the experiment in detail. They gave him two jars of flies. One of the jars they overfed, the other jar they underfed. The one they overfed flourished for a while, then all the flies died from overpopulation. The one they underfed had most of the flies survive all year. I guess there's a message in there somewhere. Evidently that experiment had a big impact on Jerry. As far as the rather cryptic cover art goes, photographer Rocky Schenk took the job very seriously. Here's a direct quote from Rocky about the cover art from his Instagram. It was just me and my assistant and a child whose name I've forgotten. My assistant made multiple trips up the street to gather hundreds of flies with a butterfly net at some horse stables. The flies kept dying, the kid kept complaining, and my assistant kept gathering more flies. So clearly, capturing the now iconic photo for Jar of Flies was quite the task, but a task that was well worth it. Recording Jar of Flies was a very collaborative process. The band would hit record, jam, and develop the outline of a track, then send it upstairs where Lane was, and he would record a rough four-track vocal demo. According to producer Toby Wright, who booked the recording session despite the band itself being credited as producers, morale was high during this time. Everybody was excited and getting along well. Rotten Apple opens Jar of Flies, which is seven minutes of pure catharsis, 
seeing the band once again settling into their soft side following Dirt. It's a laid back song, minimal in instrumentation, setting the tone so well for the rest of the EP. Lane offers a strong vocal melody, and Jerry utilizes a wah pedal and talk box over his guitar to give the track a more washy vibe. Sean Kinney compliments Rotten Apple with rather sparse drum work, while Mike Inez is rhythmically entrancing on the bass. I Stay Away takes a more symphonic approach, featuring some dramatic strings to add extra color. Easily one of the biggest choruses of Jar of Flies, with Lane soaring vocals leading the way. This track is significant for being the first time the band properly wrote with Mike Inez. Lyrically, it's largely thought to be a song about Lane's addiction, but it's actually sort of optimistic in its delivery. This was the second single from the EP, with the following track being the first. No Excuses is one of the band's most known cuts, for its directness lyrically and its iconic upbeat chorus. Jerry Cantrell and Lane play off each other so well with their harmonizing vocals here, like they were meant to be as a musical pair. The track, penned by Cantrell, is about Lane's addiction and trying to get clean, hence the title No Excuses. Drug addicts tend to have a million reasons for not quitting, and this song tackles that concept head on. No Excuses also explores Jerry and Lane's friendship and the growing tension between the two due to Lane's drug use. As time went on and his addiction worsened, the pair would drift apart significantly, but there's a line toward the end that is positive and hopeful in nature. You, my friend, I will defend, and if we change, well, I'll love you anyway. Whale and Wasp is a short instrumental moment, acting as a nice interlude which feels very reflective. The kind of song that evokes a lot of feeling effortlessly, mostly due to Jerry's subdued and somber guitar work. Don't Follow continues this gloomy trend, being the third and final single from Jar of Flies. Don't Follow seems sort of conversational in the way it's written, as Jerry and Lane take turns on vocals. Ultimately, this track is about life and all the confusing baggage that comes along with it. In this life, it's all about choices. We all forego our own individual paths, and at the end of the day, our fate is in our own hands. This is a slow track, very minimal, featuring a harmonica to add extra flair. A very dark, confessional moment. Swing on this closes Jar of Flies on a lighthearted note, which definitely was needed. The EP for the most part is very dark and brooding, so to put a rather goofy, not so serious track at the end was a good choice. It's nobody's favorite song here, but it's a nice change of pace. A bluesy, swing inspired track that is inoffensive and fun. But the absolute pinnacle of not only Jar of Flies, but Alice in Chains' entire career is, you guessed it, Nutshell. While the entire EP is A tier, Nutshell was a shining moment for the band, especially Lane Staley, as he wrote these deeply personal lyrics. Out of all the songs in the Alice in Chains catalog that demonstrated the pain and inner turmoil of Staley, this one is the most gut-wrenching. Everything about this track is essentially a summation of Staley's artistry, from his powerful vocals to his impactful lyrics. Not to mention, Mike Inez's bass work is highly creative, Jerry Cantrell on guitar is hypnotic and majestic, and Sean Kinney takes a soft and subtle approach behind the kit, lending to the track very well. The reason Nutshell is Alice in Chains' most haunting song is because of how real Lane gets lyrically. He writes of his struggles with addiction and fame, very upfront about his battles in life. This track is the turbulent life and mind of Lane Staley made into art. It's hard not to get goosebumps hearing the opening riff to Nutshell, but when the drums and Lane's vocals kick in, it's all over. Without a shadow of a doubt, one of the bleakest and most powerful songs ever written. Following the completion of Jar of Flies, the band wasn't even sure if they wanted to release it. The songs were put together so quickly in such little time, they couldn't have been any good, right? Ultimately, the band made the right decision to release the EP in January 1994, in which it received widespread acclaim and was a success commercially, debuting at number one on the Billboard 200. Over the years, Jar of Flies has become one of Alice in Chains' most known releases, a number of tracks like No Excuses, I Stay Away, and notably Nutshell, have remained staple Alice tracks. These days, whenever the current lineup of Alice in Chains plays Nutshell, it is in dedication to Lane Staley. Shortly after Jar of Flies was released, 
Lane would enter rehab for his worsening drug addiction. As you know, his life would unfortunately be consumed by drugs, leading to the band's retirement from live shows altogether in 1996, and they all but broke up. By the late 90s, after the self-titled album, MTV Unplugged, and a brief 1998 recording session which spawned Get Born Again and Died, Lane would spend the rest of his life in solitude. His health continued to deteriorate, leading to his death in 2002.